This morning, uh, I just want to bring a message of encouragement to our moms. And I want you to know how much we love you and how much we honor you. Because as moms, your role, your influence is, it is hard to overstate the importance of what you do as a mom. And we also honor you because what you do as a mom is incredibly challenging. And so I just want to speak a word of encouragement to all of our moms today. Uh, to start with, I, I want to share with you uh, uh, a fun little uh, write-up that uh, has the answers that elementary children gave to, to this, these following questions of why God made moms. So the qu first question is, why did God make mothers? Well, she's the only one who knows where the scotch tape is. <laughs> Mostly to clean house, boo, and to help us out of there when we were getting born. Now, I'm not sure where. <laughs> I'm just, uh, just reporting here. Why did God give your mother, give you your mother and not some other mom? We're related. <laughs> God knew she likes me a lot more than other people's moms like me. What kind of little girl was your mom? My mom has always been my mom and none of that other stuff. I don't know because I wasn't there, but my guess would be pretty bossy. They say she used to be nice. What did mom need to know about dad before she married him? His last name. She had to know his background, like, is he a crook? Does he get drunk on beer? Does he make at least $800 a year? Did he say no to drugs and yes to chores? Why did your mom marry your dad? My dad makes the best spaghetti in the world, and my mom eats a lot. She got too old to do anything else with him. My grandma says that mom didn't have her thinking cap on. <laughs> Great family relations there. <laughs> What's the difference between moms and dads? Moms work at work and work at home, and dads just go to work at work. <laughs> yeah, ladies, all oh, right, yeah. <laughs> moms know how to talk to teachers without scaring them. Dads are taller and stronger, but moms have all the real power because that's who you got to ask if you want to sleep over at your friends. <laughs> moms have magic. They make you feel better without medicine. Aww. <laughs> what does your mom do in her spare time? Mothers don't do spare time. <laughs> to hear her tell it, she pays bills all day long. Here's the last one. What would it take to make your mom perfect. On the inside, she's already perfect. Outside, I think some kind of plastic surgery. <laughs> and the last, last one, in, in answer to this, what would it take to make your mom perfect? Diet, D-I-E-T, D-I-E-T, diet. You know, her hair. I diet, maybe blue. And then mom would be perfect. As I said before, moms, I just want to bring a, a, just a genuine, sincere word of encouragement to all of you because of the importance of what you do and because of the challenge of what you do in raising children. It's next to impossible, as I said, to overstate the importance of what you're doing, moms, as you raise your children. William Ross Wallace uh, lived in the 1800s. He was an American poet, and he is best known for his poem, What Rules the World? 
And you'll recognize the final two lines of each of his stanzas in his poem. In fact, when we read, reach those, would you read those with me here on the screen? Blessings on the hand of women. Angels guard its strength and grace in the palace cottage hovel. Oh, no matter where the place. Wood that never storms assailed it, rainbows ever gently curled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Infancy's the tender fountain, power may with beauty flow. Mothers first to guide the streamlets, from them souls unresting grow. Grow on for the good or evil, sunshine streamed or evil hurled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Woman, how divine your mission here upon our natal sod. Keep, oh, keep the young heart open always to the breath of God. All true trophies of the ages are from mother love impearled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Blessings on the hand of women, fathers, sons, and daughters cry, and the sacred song is mingled with the worship in the sky. Mingles where no tempest darkens, rainbows evermore are hurled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. What was Wallace's point? He was highlighting the influence that mothers have in shaping the lives and the character of children. Moms, you are shaping the lives of those who are made in the image of God. What an awesome, awesome privilege and responsibility. Your children will go forth to influence and impact dozens, hundreds, thousands. And who they are and what they will accomplish in their lives is in large part because of your influence. You have the awesome opportunity and privilege to help your children to know the love of God in Christ Jesus and to live for Jesus. And I think, again, realizing the very significant differences between male and female, between fathers and mothers in their roles, and I like this video because I think it started that, ladies, there is something about the way the Lord has made you with your incredible patience and capacity to show unconditional love that is the starting place for a child to understand the unconditional love of God. Those late nights when you're the one going there to care for the child who is scared, the child who is hungry. The mom who comes and nurtures that little one is modeling the very nurture and unconditional love of God the Father. It's profound and it's sacred. And we honor you. Throughout the scriptures, we have several examples of mothers who had a tremendous influence on their children just last week, we read from the Apostle Paul's letter to Timothy, where Timothy made mention of, or Paul rather, made mention of Timothy's mother and grandmother. Consider this with me. After Paul greets Timothy in his letter, he goes on to write in verses 3 through 7 of 2 Timothy, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you, Timothy, constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in, in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And so do you see how Paul himself acknowledges that the foundation of Timothy's faith 
was laid by Timothy's mother, Eunice, and his grandmother, Lois. Now, what we discover is that Paul, on his first missionary journey, you might want to get that and uh, get those pro flowers for your mother today, later on today. <laughs> so on his first missionary journey, the Apostle Paul preached in Timothy's hometown of Lystra, which is located in modern-day Turkey, and it's presumably at that time that Lois and Eunice, both Jewish, came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Now, sometime later, J Paul made a second missionary trip where he went back to some of these same cities that he had gone to in his first missionary trip in order to encourage the churches that had been born on his first missionary journey. He went back to Lystra a second time. And here's what we read in the book of Acts. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. His disciple, or a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers of Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And so stop and think about this. The influence of his mother and his grandmother on Timothy was so strong and so positive spiritually that when Paul came back to Lystra, Timothy caught his eye and he wanted Timothy on his team. That would be like, for those of us a little older generation, that would be like Billy Graham coming to Ramona and meeting your son and saying, I want your son on my team. How awesome would that be? For this, presumably, is one of the greatest, if not the greatest evangelist who has ever lived. And Timothy was of such a character that he caught Paul's eye, and he says, I want that young man on my team. Now, those of you ladies who are raising children, and your husband is not yet a believer, how encouraging. How incredibly encouraging that through your influence as a mom, you can so shape your children's lives that they are godly men and women. That's what happened in the case of Timothy and the influence of his mother Eunice and grandmother Lois upon his life. Profound. Profound. Now, again, certainly Paul discipled Timothy once he joined his team, but again, in Paul's final letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy, Paul acknowledges that Timothy's spiritual foundation was laid at home. Paul's familiarity with God's word, with the scriptures, was established at home through his mother and his grandmother. Again, let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. And you can see it here on the screen. Paul writes to Timothy, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from, all, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Where was it that Timothy was first introduced to God's word? In his home. By whom? His mother and his grandmother. They laid the solid foundation. And on that foundation then, God used their ministry in Timothy's life to shape him into a godly man who, like Paul, would have great impact for the Lord Jesus Christ. How encouraging. 
And you know, as I listen and I have conversation with so many of our mothers within our church family, I am so blessed uh, by what I am hearing, the, the young moms who are really discipling their children with great wisdom and great impact. And it, it's exciting. It is, it is exciting and a blessing to hear how you are raising your children in Christ. I want to encourage you, as I know Kathy wants you to encourage, right over there, there's a reason why she put that sign on that door, Kids Library Entrance, because she's amassing uh, resources, DVDs and books and so on, that will be a huge help to you as you disciple your children day in and day out. It's ways of engaging them uh, in stories that center on Christ, center on Christian men and women who have lived for Christ. Uh, DVDs that have to do with apologetics. Why do we believe what we believe? What's the evidence? And these are all assets and resources that we want to make available to come alongside and support you in your influence upon your children for Christ. So make sure that you avail yourselves of these resources that are available. So moms, we honor you because what you do is so very important. We also honor you because what you do is so incredibly challenging. Now, I've shared in the past that there were times as we raised our three children that I was absolutely amazed at Kathy's patience with our three kids, particularly when they were young and they were always in need of something and it was always usually right at dinner time. The world was just coming apart for our kids at dinner time, you know. And just to watch the way Kathy handled that with patience. And I thought to myself on a number of occasions, if it were me, I would have lost my mind. Or as Nate so eloquently put it, I would have killed one of my kids. <laughs> I just don't have that capacity. And I love my kids to death. In some situations, I will. But there, there, I was just absolutely amazed because, and particularly those of our moms who are raising little ones, that is just flat out hard work. Caring just for their basic needs, right? Keeping them fed, keeping them clothed, um, training them in just basic humanity and uh, meeting their needs and their bumps and their bruises and their squabbles and all of that just is just an <laughs> incredible amount of work. And then what compounds that in this day is we live in a culture that devalues motherhood and implies that if you're not working outside the home, you're not working. Well, that's insanity. And then we live in a culture under the God of this world, Satan, that hates you women, going clear back to the garden, that enmity that God said he would put between you, or the serpent, Satan, and the woman, that's been our history, and it still is the situation in the world today. You are hated by Satan, because through the woman came the Messiah. And then we live in a world that increasingly attacks our children and wants to destroy them. And so what you do as a Christian mom in discipling your children and just caring for their basic needs day in and day out, and then you're on the front lines of spiritual warfare with your kids, what you do is incredibly challenging. And it is amazing. And we honor you and we applaud you and we appreciate you and we love you for what you are doing as you take that challenge on day in and day out. And I can imagine, like all good-hearted people who want to do what is righteous and want to do what is good before the Lord, that there are days when you wonder to yourself, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? Ladies, do any of you have that? Yeah, ever question yourself and wonder, am I doing this right or am I like, like the worst mom in the world? Any, any of you ever had that thought before? Every, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Every day and twice on Sunday, right? Yeah. 
will bless you, bless you, because in that you're expressing a humility rather than an arrogance. And now I'm going to say something to our older moms, perhaps those who have raised your children and you've launched your children. Older moms, our younger moms, need you. Do you hear me? Our younger moms desperately need a relationship with you older moms. They need your experience. They need your wisdom. They need your loving kindness. They just need somebody older who has already navigated these waters of parenting to just talk to, to hear them, to listen to them, and to offer those pearls, those apples of gold. But just your love and your support and your encouragement. Older moms, veteran moms, our younger ladies need you desperately as they're navigating these same waters that you've already come through. Will you, are you willing to reach out and to love our younger moms? You see, this is the way it's supposed to be within the church. Look at Paul's instructions to Titus as Titus was also pastoring and teaching churches. In Titus chapter two, beginning with verse one, Paul writes to Titus, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So what is the vision of the church? That the older women are what? Disdainful of the younger women because they're from a younger generation that's screwing everything up, right? <laughs> the older women are to be what in relationship to the younger women? Teaching them, training them, encouraging them, loving on them. And so this is where I beg you, older veteran moms, please, 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 please choose to reach out to our younger ladies. To reach out to our younger moms. And Kat, my wife Kathy, and she didn't ask me to do this. I am doing this because I believe in it. She's put together this coming summer a play day on Tuesdays here on the church campus. If we can go ahead and throw that up there, Steve. This is a play day. It's an opportunity to make new friends, enjoy good conversation, and let the kids run out here on the playground in the grass area. But it's designed as a place where Young moms can meet other young moms, and then older moms can come and get, meet these young moms and begin to build relationships with one another. It's not that you're going to have a friendship with every young mom who's there. We know that you can't force those, but you will connect with one or two. And older moms, I am begging you not to see this as just something for the young moms who have kids just to get them out of the house. This is an opportunity for you to come and love on their children, meet their children, but also love on these younger ladies, these younger moms who need you. Kathy, do you want to say anything about that? Or? Okay. You know, if you cried a little bit, you'd probably <laughs> seal the deal. Oh, oh. Thanks, honey. So, 
So as we close, uh, moms, I, I hope you're hearing uh, our heart for you this morning. That we recognize and we honor you because the job that you do is so important and because the job you do is so challenging. And we just want you to know that, that we love you and we're 100% behind you and we're so grateful for your ministry. We have just a couple of moments and I'm gonna ask uh, several of the men, if you would, uh, and I'll close, but several men, would you stand and would you pray and would you pray blessing and protection and strength upon our moms and gratitude? Would you lead us? Uh, three or four men, and then I'll close us and we'll be dismissed this morning. All right, let's pray together.